Every day when I wake up in the morning, I see the sky and I think about the things that you've made, all the beauty and your glory is showing. Yeah. It never bores me to look at the ocean. The waves are crashing, and the water spraying up in my face. To look above and all the seagulls are soaring. Yeah. Got to overcome the darkness so we don't get caught in the middle between the hopeful and the heartless. So, hello, good day, good morning. I just can't stop smiling because today is a brand new day. And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me. Oh, Lord, what a beautiful day. All the planets surround me The way they orbit just boggles my mind The way the sun keeps on shining, yeah We've got to overcome the darkness So we don't get caught in the middle Between the hopeful and the heartless So, hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Cause today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay It's the day that the Lord has made day that the Lord has made. There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It's the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has it's made. the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. So, hello, good day, good morning. I just can't stop smiling. Cause today is a brand new day. And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me. Oh Lord, what a beautiful day Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Live with Doug. We are thinking through God's Word together. Glad that you are with us as we continue our study of the book of Isaiah. Today, we're going to finish up chapter 22. We are just flying, screaming through this uh, through this book. <laughs> Not really, but it is August 1st. It is August 1st, a new month in the reign of King Jesus, the year of our Lord, 2022, August 1st. Celebrate, rejoice. Be glad. No, Martin, I have not watched those videos yet. I will. Uh, I will, though. I was going to yesterday. Things got uh, busy with other things, but I'll uh, take a look at those. And I agree with you. Christ is reigning and he will restore all things until he crushes his enemies. Everybody agrees with that. It's just a matter of timing. So anyway, speaking of that, uh, nope, not speaking of that. Uh, little uh, program note here next Monday, one week from tonight. We start our next NCST class, that is the New Covenant School of Theology, and we're going to study the Gospel of John and the Epistles of John, and uh, if you would like to join us, we'd love to have you. Go to newcovenantschooloftheology.org, hit on apply, and send us a uh, brief application there, and uh, we'll sign you up, and you can join us for that. It's Monday, Tuesday nights, block courses, four weeks. It's going to be a good one. Uh, John is a... a just, I'm sure you know, is, uh, is full of some great stuff. All right, so today we're, like I said, we're in Isaiah 22, and I actually want to start with the book of Revelation. Uh, as I've said to you before, there, there are so many allusions in Revelation to the Old Testament, to uh, Isaiah and other prophets, and they're more allusions than quotes, typically. And so you need to know what these symbols or events or, or figures, what they meant and communicated in the Old Testament before you try to discern what John is seeing in the book of Revelation. And today we have one of those 
Uh, and this is the this is one of the closer uh, this one is closer to a quote than just an illusion. But here's what uh, our Lord says to uh, Philadelphia here in Revelation three, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, and then notice this section, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. So if you know how uh, these letters to those seven churches typically work out, uh, we, we've seen a vision of Jesus, or John has earlier, and, and then he begins to pull from some of those things and, and apply them to specific churches. And here, he's describing himself as holy and true, which is common through the uh, book of Revelation, right? But then he, he says this, he says, I have the key of David, and I open things, and no one has the authority to shut them, and I can shut them, and no one opens. And then he goes on and says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have little strength. You have kept my word and have not denied my name. So we can infer here a little bit that these these people have been knocked down. They've been kind of crushed, but they've been faithful. And the Lord is, is encouraging them, saying, I've opened this door, and no one else can shut it from you. Well, this is the first century. And we will see here. Well, let me just let me just read it. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to persevere. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole earth, a whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, so that no one may take away your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of my the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of, from heaven uh, from my God, and I will write on uh, him my new name. So you could tell these people are under the threat of persecution here by what Jesus calls the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not. Uh, so again, I don't want to get too much in Revelation here, but uh, apparently they are being persecuted by the Jews. They've been faithful, and Jesus says those people are not actually Jews. They claim to be, but they're lying. They're really a synagogue of Satan. Kind of draws up illusions of Jesus saying to the Pharisees, uh, you all uh, claim to be children of Abraham and claim that God is your father, but no, 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 Satan is your father. Remember, remember some of that dialogue? So the Jews pouring on the heat to this early church, and they've, they have persevered. But, but what do the Jews say? We see this all through the book of Acts, for instance. The Jews claimed to be the, uh, the, the keepers of the law of God, the people of God, you needed to become circumcised and be a Jew and submit to the law of Moses if you're going to be saved, if you're going to be of the people of God, even after Jesus came. That's what they were claiming. And they claimed to have the keys to the kingdom. Uh, they may not have used that terminology, but that's that's kind of the image. You have to go through us to be right with God. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I have the keys to the kingdom. If I open the door, then you can come in and no one has the authority to shut you out. So you can see how encouraging this would be to these people who came from Judaism, came to Christ. Now they're being shunned and persecuted by the Jews in the synagogue. And Jesus is saying, they're not the keepers of the way to the kingdom. I am. In fact, I'm going to make them bow to you. Just hold fast persevere, stay true to me, and don't worry about them. I'll open a door and they don't have the authority to shut it because they are not the keepers of the kingdom. That's the kind of thing going on here. Well, Jesus said something similar, fascinatingly, to the apostles and in particular to Peter. You remember this? Uh, 
after Peter makes his great confession here, you are the Christ, Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the, son of the living God. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say this to you, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Fascinating. Jesus says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. He says it to Peter. Now, if you know anything about Roman Catholicism, this is uh, one of those verses they use to give to the Pope authority that uh, God certainly never gives. But he, but there is Jesus is saying this to, to Peter here. And we see some uh, example of this in uh, in Book of Acts, for instance, when when uh, Ananias and Sapphira come to Peter, and Peter basically says, "You know, you're you, you people are dead men walking." I don't know that that means that Ananias and Sapphira are shut out of the kingdom. It's it's hard to discern that, but they are lying to the Holy Spirit, and Peter. Uh, basically pronounces their death right then and there. Uh, a little bit later to Simon the sorcerer. He basically says, you and your money perish together, even though it says that Simon believed. So uh, anyway, that opens up all kinds of questions. And uh, we're in Isaiah, not Acts or Revelation or Matthew. But this idea of keys to the kingdom starts much earlier than the Gospels or Revelation, and it goes all the way back here to Isaiah. So let's let's get back to our text. If you remember, we looked at this uh, last week. Chapter 22 is the Valley of Vision. And this is the oracle on the Jews, Jerusalem, after he has seen visions of other nations being at war and judged and falling and, and all that. Now he's coming back to the Jews, and he is uh, rebuking them for their self-sufficiency. The Jews were convinced they had built their walls, they had their water supply, they have their weapons, and kind of a quesara attitude. Well, if, uh, if the enemy comes and lays siege to us, well, let's eat, drink tomorrow. Eat and drink, be merry, because tomorrow we may die. But we're prepared. We think we can handle this. And God says, no, you're not prepared, and no, you can't handle it, because I'm going to ju- destroy you. And you looked to your defenses instead of looking to me. And we pick up here then in verse 15, thus says the Lord God of hosts. And I I know I make a big deal of this often, but the host of what? Host of armies, host of angelic beings. God commands the myriads of angels to do his bidding. And I, I know for me, I have to remind myself of this. Maybe this is why I stop and remind you of this all the time. This is still true. Uh, King Jesus now is reigning over heaven and earth. All authority has been given to him, and he has myriads upon myriads of angels at his disposal that he uses to work out his purposes all over the world all the time. Today, there are hosts of armies of angels that are working in the world in ways that we can't perceive, and Jesus is the commander-in-chief of all of them. Let's not become secularists or nationalists, or I'm sorry, naturalists. <laughs> Freudian slip there of all the talk these days of Christian nationalism and all that. Let's not become naturalists and forget there's this whole spiritual realm that is ruled over by our king. The God of hosts always has been that. And here to Jews, he says, the Lord God of hosts says, come to this, uh, come go to this steward to Shebna, who is in charge of of the royal household. So the, the steward of the household uh, at that time, what <laughs> Martin, man, you have a one track mind, man. Uh, but just stay with me, okay? Don't, don't try to take me down the path there. Um, so the, the steward is was the one who, on behalf of the king, was basically the ruler of the whole household. Uh, similar to... Uh, Egypt, you know, when, when, the, when the Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of the whole kingdom, basically, and, the, and the, the Pharaoh could do whatever he wanted to, he could go on vacation, he could just hang out, play video games or whatever, because he had entrusted the, the, the lead, the, the rulership of everything to the, to the, the one at his right hand. Uh, and as the steward, he was responsible to Pharaoh, but 
but he pretty much had the the authority over over the whole household, the the, the other servants, and 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 kind of kind of like a chief of staff, but uh, but much more authority than a chief of staff in a democracy kind of thing. So this Shebna has a whole lot of power, and uh, and he it got to his head. The Lord says, you know, go to him, to Shebna, who's the charge of the royal household. What right do you have here? And whom do you have here? That you have hewn a tomb for yourself here. You who hew a tomb on the height. You who carve a resting place for yourself in the rock. So Shebna, uh, his power has gone to his head to such a degree that he is acting like he is... Uh, a great king. He's one of the great men, and he wants to be remembered like one of the great men. And uh, he, he's he's using the wealth of this seat of power to carve out this tomb for himself. That was reserved for the great and mighty men and the wealthy. And Shebna became wealthy in this role, but he, he's a servant. He's a steward, so he doesn't really have any right to be remembered like the great men, but he thinks he does. And so he is uh, taking upon himself to make this tomb. God says, behold, the Lord is about to hurl you headlong, O man. He's about to grasp you firmly and roll you tightly like a ball to be cast into a vast country. There you will die. And there your splendid chariots will be. You shame of your master's house. I will depose you from your office and I will pull you down from your station. So this arrogant one who is uh, self-sufficient, making a name for himself, God says, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to lead you to another nation, another country, and you're going to be ashamed and humiliated there because you're, you're a shame. You're, you're a humiliation to your people and to me. So we see here an individual, right? All through Isaiah, we have seen God rebuke the Jews for their self-sufficiency, their arrogance, uh, their refusal to acknowledge God, depend on God, call upon God, all of those things. And here's an individual who embodies that, and he's in a place of high authority. And so God is going to make an example out of him. And I love the imagery there. I'm going I'm to wound you. I'm going I'm to roll you up like a ball and throw you uh, into uh, you know, to a, a foreign nation, and the foreign nation is going to... Um, mock you, shame you, humiliate you kind of thing. And that'll be a, a symbol to the whole nation. He goes on. Then it will come about in that day that I will summon my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. And you can read about both these men very briefly in, uh, in 2 Kings. So I'm going to call, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to replace you uh, Shebna with, uh, with my servant and I will clothe him with your tunic and tie your sash securely about him. I will entrust him with your authority, and he will become a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of David. You see, he's going to have this role that you have, and and you've been a steward of the household of David and ruling over them. Well, he's going to become that one. I'm going to take, you know, basically your uniform, your your military stripes, your all the symbols that you wear that show you are the, the right hand of the king here. You're the ruler and authority. And I'm going to put it on him, replace you with him. And he will have charge over the whole household of Jerusalem and Judea. And to symbolize his power, he says, then I will set the key of the house of David on his shoulder. When he opens, no one will shut when he shuts, no one will open. <coughs> Excuse me. So we think of keys to doors as very small things, right? You have a you have a key ring, and it's got three, four, five, ten, sometimes you know, twenty, thirty keys on it. If you're in a job where you have to open all all kinds of doors, um, so our keys are are rather small, a couple inches long, maybe maybe smaller. But the keys in those days were much larger. Uh, you know, six, eight inches, sometimes a foot long, and uh, and they would be chained around someone's neck and, and hang like a heavy pennant on uh, on someone's neck. Uh, and so the the one who is in this place of authority 
for the city gate, for the palace doors, he would have the key that would un- unlock the, the city gates or the palace doors, this, this steward who was put in this position. And on behalf of the, the high king, he, he could open and no one else had the key to lock the palace door or the city gate. So he could say, all right, there are people coming. I want them to enter the city, so I'm going to open the gate and no one else can shut it because I have this huge key and it's the only one. Conversely, I recording the re- streaming apparently just shut down and uh, could you give me a thumbs up? Somebody let me know if we're back on here. We're almost done, but uh, it, I a sign popped up that says the streaming stopped. Are y'all back with me? Anybody, anybody here looking uh, for some indication? Thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Any, any indication? All right. Well, I'm going to go on. We're almost done anyway. And uh, if you need to catch the end of this uh, on, uh, after I post it here shortly, uh, Lon says that you're back. Okay, good. Well, like I said, I'm just about done here. Um, so uh, what was I, what was I saying? So he, the Eli- Eliakim has this, this very real authority to decide who gets into Jerusalem and who does not. Which is interesting, right? When, when Jesus says, uh, I am the one that has this key and can uh, allow you into the new Jerusalem or not. And then he gives Peter uh, and the apostles some of that authority, which is, which is fascinating. Uh, it's, it's not to be taken that, uh, that the apostles had absolute authority but they were sent on behalf of Jesus and they had real authority. And so there's a sense in which as his uh, vice regent, as his, um, as, his stu- um, as his stewards, you might say, uh, they had authority there, but ultimately it's Jesus, not, not anyone he sends. No, no elder, no pastor, no, no missionary, and certainly not the apostles. No, no one has ultimate authority there. That all rests with Jesus himself to truly decide uh, who gets in and, and who doesn't. But they, they were acting on his behalf. And that's what Eliakim here was doing on behalf of the king. And uh, to, just to finish up Isaiah 22 here, God says, I will drive him like a peg in a firm place, and he will become a throne of glory to his father's house. Now, again, you see the allusion here to to Jesus, right? Eliakim is a, is a type of, uh, of Jesus here. He's going to be a, a peg. Now, there's going to be a, a, a there's he he's going to be driven in this case you'd think tent peg that's what the peg us, usually was but as we'll see in a moment this is a a peg in a wall that holds up a shelf or or holds other valuable th- things excuse me um, but God's going to drive this Eliakim as a peg and uh, this imagery that he will become a throne of glory a glorious throne to his father's house. In contrast to Shebna, the the steward, who is arrogant and draws attention to himself and is all about himself, this one is going to be a throne of glory to his father David. You can see all the illusion now, all the 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 imagery that also represents the ultimate fulfillment fulfillment of this with Jesus. But in this case of the the original peg here, Eliakim it still turns out badly for the Jew. So they have this arrogant steward, Shebna, who God is going to humiliate, remove, and replace with Eliakim. And Eliakim's going to do well, but the Jews are going to do what they do. Oh, Eliakim, he's successful. He's a good steward. We're going to place all of our trust in him instead of on God. And that's going to be disastrous. Look at verse 24. So they, the Jews, will hang on him, Eliakim, all the glory of his father's house, offspring, and issue, and all the lease of the vessels from bowls to the jars. So he's going to be the peg driven to hold up this shelf, and they're going to put all their trust, all their vessels, big and small. Everything is going to be put on this this man, Eliakim. It's like a, a peg in a house, a shelf that holds everything, and they're going to put all their trust in him instead of on the Lord. And God says, in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, the peg driven in a firm place will give way. It will even break off and fall, and the load hanging on it will be cut off, for the Lord has spoken. So 
uh, we just see this repeated pattern of the Jews. Uh, even when God provides a a worthy, when he puts someone there that's worthy to follow and trust his vessel, his instrument, they still miss it. They still put their hope in themselves and their leader instead of in tr- uh, trusting themselves to the God who who's in charge of everything, who's the king of all glory, the one ultimately who has bringing all this uh, to be. Constant uh, um, error of the Jews that cost them mightily. For us, when the true Eliakim came, when that peg in the father's house, the glory of the throne of David came, he says, no, I am the one now that you can trust and you should trust. Right? He's the fulfillment, the ultimate one, and he's a peg that will not ever be driven. We know that Jesus is, is the one who truly has the key, who is the ultimate Eliakim. He's all of it. And we need to take warning here from the Jews and not trust in any human, humans outside of Jesus. Uh, we don't trust in our traditions, whatever religious tradition you come from. Don't trust in that tradition. Uh, don't trust in, in human leaders of any kind, whether it's in the church or in the government. Don't trust in systems of theology. Uh, don't trust in your favorite theologians of old. Those, you know, you've read these these folks and you're just you, you've gained so much for them. Yeah, great. Learn from them, but let them all be arrows pointing toward Christ, and never to hang your hopes on any human, any institution, any 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 historical period of time. You know, we don't look back to the good old days. Oh, if we could only be like them again. No, those were those good old days were never as good as as we think they are. Historians, you know, they they don't uh, they don't always capture the the heart of the uh, the truth. Uh, so we can thank God for all of that and learn from it. But our hope must always be in King Jesus, who has the key to open and shut as He wills. And when He opens, people can come in. And when He shuts, you can't come in. We rest in Him. Uh, So as we begin this new month, the reign of King Jesus, and this new day of the reign of King Jesus, serve him, trust in him. Don't put your hope in your government, your church, church leaders, yourself, none of that. Trust in our King and our Lord. Let's do that today. And uh, if he is willing, we will come back tomorrow and look at the King of Tyre and uh, what God's oracle for him is. Take care. Have a great one.